Thank you, Christine. I, I do have a question about, um, we have all those participants, but now on the screen, I see about five by five. So they're not, they're not all using video, I understand then. Or um, they may want to turn their video on if they'd like. They, some people are not sharing their video, which is completely okay. Um, but if you're only seeing five, then up in your upper right hand corner, you'll see speaker view. You might want to play around with that a little bit and you might see more people. Yeah, there's a little array of about three by three dots. If you hit that, then you should get a little, um, little box for everybody and you won't be the main. Well, anyway, I just found that out yesterday, so I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm catching up. Well, good morning, good morning. Just welcome, welcome to all of you. Um, if you don't know, and if you're new and, or you're a guest of Dan's, that our learning retirement programs have been running um, for a number of years through the campus. And you can contact uh, Christine or Melanie at the office and find out how to become um, a part of this programming, which is just uh, because we're now virtual has just opened it up to a lot of members or a lot of people that we'd love to have you join us and share ideas for further programming. So to get on with this climate program, um, we're welcoming Dan Barth this morning, Brian Bushnell, and um, maybe other guests that uh, Dan would introduce later. But Dan is our new speaker, and he is from the Citizen Climate Lobby and has been a member since 2015. And that year, he also took over as being the um, lead person in Rib Mountain and Marshfield. He really he has a degree in psychology, uh, worked in the anthropology area, almost got that degree, uh, which he also an area that he loves. But he has put his, um, his heart, he and his wife has put his heart where his thinking is about climate change. Um, is retired and they have Chevy Volts, solar panels, raise a garden, heat with wood, are very wise about their use of, of plastics and selling back electricity. He just, uh, it's not only, like I said, living how he feels about the environment, but also sharing that message today. So Dan, we'll turn that over to you. Well, well, thank you, Ruth. Good morning to everybody. It's wonderful to see so many faces out there. Um, this is kind of neat because tomorrow, as we all know, is Earth Day, and it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And um, so this is a, a very appropriate moment for us to be having this the show. Thank you, Ruth. And thank you, Christine. This is, this is fabulous. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, stand up for just a minute so that you can see the proof that I belong to the Citizens Climate Hobby. I'm wearing it here on my chest, CCL. Uh, those are our initials. So um, welcome, everyone. Um, the, the basic message and the underlying message here is that uh, climate change is real. Climate change is really serious. In fact, most climate scientists will say that uh, climate change is the most serious threat facing the human race at this particular time, much more so than, than even the coronavirus. Um, and we are the cause. Unwittingly, uh, we didn't know it, but as we, were, as we are driving our cars around, um, uh, lighting our our house and running our appliances with coal-fired or uh, gas-fired electricity. Uh, we, we are, uh, as we are buying food that's being shipped in from California or Mexico or wherever, we are contributing to the climate crisis that we're facing. Um, and that's, that's, um, that's not good news, but uh, the good news is that there's a lot of good news in that. Uh, the first piece of good news that I'm going to share is that since we are responsible, um, we can do something about it. And that's what the Citizens Climate Lobby and this presentation is really all about, isn't it? Um, so uh, there's another piece of good news here, and it's connected with the coronavirus. There's a couple of pieces of good news connected with the, the coronavirus. One of them is that it's taught us that we can, we can, we can unite globally to, to, to take on a serious threat. Um, as we speak, there are people all over this world who are sitting at home, instead of running around to the restaurant or the grocery store or the, the tavern, 
and, um, and, and we're all doing it because we know that we need to do it. So that's kind of good news because it's going to take everybody on this planet to do something about climate change. The other thing that's good news is that, um, yeah, I don't know if you've been, been following it, but in big cities around the world, people are amazed at how clean the air has gotten since we've been parking our cars and our, and our uh, airplanes. And, and, uh, and, and so it, it kind of shows us the impact that burning fossil fuels is really having on our life. People in, in cities that couldn't see their cities before and were afraid to breathe the air in our cities are thrilled at how clean their, their air is. And that, if that isn't good news, I don't know what it is. The other good news is, boy, this is a lot of good news. Um, the other good news is that we don't have to sit at home. Uh, we don't have to uh, you know, walk everywhere or ride, just ride bikes everywhere to have this kind of an impact. There, there are some wonderful technologies today that we can choose to use that will have the same wonderful impact on our environment and on our climate. However, before we go there, I think I see my good friend and fellow CCL member, Dr. Bruce Krawitz, sitting there. And he's going to say a few words because we're also focused on health right now. I think uh, Dr. Krawitz is going to say something to us about uh, the health impacts of climate change. And I think he's unmuted himself. So take it away, Bruce. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am a retired physician and I do uh, research part time on the health effects of climate change. And I'm going to talk about the health effects uh, very briefly. I hope that you're all able to hear me okay. Um, well, the first thing, and possibly the most important, is a reduction in agricultural harvests. Uh, uh, climate change causes more floods, and it also causes more droughts. Um, you, you are, I'm sure you're we're all familiar with the huge drought that's been occurring west of the Rocky Mountains for many years. Uh, and I'm sure you're all aware that now in the Midwest, we have more spring flooding than we ever did before. Um, and uh, so the combination of droughts and floods reduces agricultural harvests. Uh, probably you're not aware of it, but uh, the countries around the Mediterranean are also experiencing a drought. Uh, South Africa is experiencing a drought. And uh, the Middle East and Central Australia are experiencing temperatures during the summer that are so high that it's m more difficult to grow crops. So uh, what it's predicted uh, by scientists that uh, agriculture will decline in the world by 2% per decade. Uh, and this decline has already begun, actually, that 2017 was uh, less of a harvest than 2016. Uh, and, uh, and because of climate disasters, there is expected to be a steady decline in agriculture. Uh, the second thing that I want to mention is that there will also probably be a decline in seafood harvests. And the reason for this is uh, that the oceans are also getting warmer, uh, just like the air is. And when water warms, it contains less oxygen. And that means it can support less life. Uh, so uh, warming of water is harmful to sea organisms. I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea that when a lake gets warm, many of the fish in the lake die. Uh, and, um, and you just, it's the same idea expanded to the ocean. Another problem that the ocean uh, faces is the carbon dioxide that we release into the atmosphere also goes into the ocean. 
and it makes the ocean more acid. So uh, the ocean has two problems uh, as it warms, declining oxygen and more acidity. Okay, so that's the first two problems, decline in agriculture, decline in seafood harvest. A third problem is uh, toxic blooms. And toxic blooms happen when uh, water becomes warm and it also becomes contaminated with uh, sewage or fertilizer. And what happens then is that microorganisms grow very fast and they use up all the oxygen and kill everything in the water. And they also make the water poisonous for drinking or swimming if it was fresh water to begin with. And probably in the news uh, over the last few years, you've heard of toxic blooms occurring in Florida, along the coast of Florida and in Lake Erie uh, and at the mouth of the Mississippi River um, and then a fourth problem, rising sea levels. Uh, in, the, in the 20th century, if we average rising sea level over the years, uh, in the 20th century, the sea level rose by 1.2 millimeters per year. And so far in the 21st century, if we average out the rise in sea levels, it's 3.2 millimeters per year. So the sea levels are rising more than twice as fast as they were in the past. Um, and that of course is because of melting ice on land and also because of something I'm not gonna talk about that's called thermal expansion of water. So uh, a fifth problem is more infectious disease carried by insects and ticks. So, uh, um, just as an example, uh, in Canada, there did, there did not, uh, they did not have Lyme disease until the year 2000. Uh, but then it became warm enough for ticks to live in Canada. And now Canada has Lyme disease, just like we do in, say, Maine or Wisconsin or Minnesota. So Lyme disease is a disease that increases from climate change because of heat. Other diseases are, other examples are West Nile encephalitis, uh, dengue fever, and malaria. Uh, I'll give just malaria as another example that there used to be uh, more elevated areas of Africa that were free from malaria because they were too cold for mosquitoes. The mosquito who carries malaria is called an Anopheles mosquito, and it's a tropical mosquito. But as uh, the climate has become warmer in Africa, um, then uh, Anopheles mosquitoes can live higher at higher altitudes and have brought malaria to places that formerly did not have it. And then the sixth point, the last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, people in the future will have to work in extreme heat uh, and outdoor workers will suffer uh, from extreme heat. Uh, and I'll just give an example of the U.S. military. Not too long ago, uh, the U.S. military uh, health service reported that uh, a heat stroke, which is the medical term for heat stroke is hyperthermia, uh, has increased about threefold among members of the U.S. Marine Corps because they are now in hotter temperatures. Now, the majority of Marines are actually stationed in the United States. So what this tells us is that Marine bases in the U.S. are getting hotter and Marines are suffering from heat stroke more often. So now I'm done. I'm just going to list these six things again. And just to help you to remember, reduced agriculture, reduced seafood harvest, toxic blooms in water, rising sea levels, more diseases are, are caused by insects and ticks, and uh, exposure to extreme heat for outdoor workers. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. 
Um, so um, I'm going to go right now and I'm going to just talk a little bit about what we can do um, to, uh, to, to deal with climate change, bad climate change. But the, the most important thing that you're going to hear me say today is that even if everybody watches this, who's watching this right now, who's participating in this right now, um, does all of the things that I'm going to be talking about, it won't be enough. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do do the, do these things, but um, this is uh, climate change is a global issue. This is something that we're all going to need to get on board with, and that's why Brian is going to be talking about the the political a aspects and the political side of this. And that's why we belong to the Citizen Climate Lobby because um, I'm really proud of what my wife and I are doing, and. Um, and, but we also know that everyone needs to get on board with this, and that's probably going to take legislation. So um, having said that, uh, and I don't, I don't mean to diminish the, the importance of the things that we need to do as individuals, it's just that um, it's, it's, it, we all need to do this. So I'm going to put a picture up, um, and, and this, is the, this is the reason why I, I hope you can see this. But uh, this is the reason why I'm so involved with uh, doing something about the climate. This is my granddaughter, Zoe. And I'll bet you that you have a child or a granddaughter just like Zoe, and that uh, you want the best for her. And we, we, do, we, went to, we go to great extremes to, uh, to give them the best possible life we can give them. Um, and, um, and but we, we, what we really need to be thinking about is what kind of environment, what kind of climate uh, we want for her. This is where Zoe lives. And um, it's, uh, it's a pretty beautiful picture of a very beautiful planet. And, um, and that's where we all are, of course. Um, but uh, it also, in my mind, highlights just how vulnerable we are because this is taken from fairly close to our planet. Uh, this is what we look like from Mars. I don't know if you can see that little dot on there, but that's Earth. And we are surrounded by um, the vacuum uh, of space. And uh, it really says to me that we need to take care of this wonderful planet of ours. So, Dan? Yes. Um, I don't believe you shared your screen. Oh, I thought I did. Let me try it again. Uh, you're, you're probably right. Uh, let's put this back up on here. This is Earth. There we go. <laughs> Can you see it now? Okay. It's, it's That's coming. Mars. A little dot there. And um, boy, if that doesn't tell you just how vulnerable, how alone, how important it is that we take care of this planet, I don't know what does. Um, that says to me, that, that darkness there, that space, <laughs> that's the vacuum of space. Uh, we're very fortunate to have this planet. It seems like uh, we ought to be taking very good care of it. So I'm going to come back now. I'm going to go and show you, show, show you Zoe, just because she's my granddaughter. <laughs> so can you see her? Yes. Okay. All right, I'm coming back. Here we go because my internet connection is unstable. I'm hoping that you can hear me. Yes, you can hear. Okay, all right. I, I can't seem to get back to um, where I want to be here. And I'm, okay, I'm stop, share. All right, here we go. Now, Okay, so um, this, this, uh, this list of things that I'm going to be talking about here in a second, uh, a lot of this comes out of a book called Drawdown. And um, uh, I urge you to go to Drawdown. If you Google Drawdown, drawdown.org, you'll come up with some really wonderful information about things that you can do. And a lot of this comes from that. So um, here we go, and I'll take some time with it. Uh, probably the most, the first thing I'm going to say is um, I'm going to put a plug in for the Citizens Climate Lobby. 
join the Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, we are working very hard to, uh, to, 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 to get our government to pass legislation that will help us all get involved with doing what we need to do to deal with climate change. We can certainly use your help. We can use your energy. We can use your creativity. Um, okay, on with the rest of my list. LED lights. Believe it or not, LED lights have a real impact. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with getting out and getting some LED lights and getting them in your house. Um, it'll not only help our climate, but it'll also help your electric bill. Um, a couple of years ago, actually almost three years ago now, I took a very, a very scary step. It was very frightening for me. Um, I bought an electric car. It's a Chevy Volt. Okay, so it's, uh, it's sort of a, a, a trade-off. It's electric for about 50 miles, and then um, if I keep on going after that, it'll it'll turn a gasoline engine on and and run uh, for as long as I keep putting gasoline in it, I guess. Um, but we live between Wausau and Stevens Point, about halfway, and um, I can go to Wausau and shop. I can go to Stevens Point to my meetings and. I work in, a, I do some volunteer work in a community bike shop there. I can go to both those towns, which is 90% of our driving. And I'll never, I'll never come off the battery. So we, uh, um, I was afraid to buy the car because it's a new technology like the rest of you. Uh, I grew up with uh, the, I call it the infernal combustion engine. Um, and as many problems as it creates for us, we know it, we trust it. And that's our, that's our go-to concept when we think about buying a new car. Uh, when I sat in the sales manager's office and he tried to sell me uh, uh, an expensive uh, insurance policy to protect this high-tech car, as he called it, I almost, I almost uh, bolted. I, I, I said, no, I'm not going to do this. And I walked out of the office and drove up to buy a Prius, which my wife and one of my cousin's uncles had been trying to tell me to buy instead of the Volt. And uh, I got about 10 miles up the road and I turned around and went back and got the Volt. It has been the most wonderful car I've ever owned. Um, we drive on, on electricity almost all of the time. It's smooth, it's like driving on a, with a magic carpet. Um, it's very quiet, uh, very comfortable plenty of power if we want to use it. However, uh, the car will tell you that if you use a lot of power, you're going to use a lot of energy. At any rate, that was about three years ago. I have had no mechanical problems with the car whatsoever. I changed the oil in my car just before we drove it out to Grand Junction, Colorado in February uh, because I, the, the, uh, uh, I felt like I should do it. The Chevy says change it every two years in the engine if you need to or not. Um, it had been a little bit over two years, so I changed it. Uh, that's the first, that's the only maintenance expense that I've had with it. I uh, put very little gasoline into it, as I said, almost always on electricity. Now, uh, then I thought, boy, wouldn't it be neat if I could charge this up, this car up with sunshine? So uh, we went to the Midwest Renewable Energy Association people and said, we'd like to, we'd like to put solar panels on, on the roof of our house, which is my next suggestion. So one of them is get an electric car. Um, we, uh, transportation is the number one source of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And we all know we need to stop putting those greenhouse gases in. Don't be afraid of an electric car. They're absolutely wonderful vehicles. I've never had a, a, a nicer car. However, um, I, I thought, wouldn't it be neat to be able to charge the car with sunshine? So we put solar panels on the roof of our house. Um, we now charge our car every, whenever it's sunny out and we need to put electricity in the car, we're plugged in. And, um, and I can tell you that for the most part, we're driving around on, on, uh, on solar derived electricity. So um, those two things are really important things to think about doing, but they're not the only thing. Uh, one, uh, one other, another thing is to eat a plant rich diet. 
lots of vegetables, lots of fruit, nuts, lots of nuts and seeds. Um, cut down on the amount of meat that we're eating. Cut down on the amount of actual milk that we're drinking. Cattle have a real unfortunate issue, and that is that they they burp a lot of methane. In fact, I, they're a huge source of methane. Um, agriculture has some issues to deal with. There might be good news there also. There is a there is some uh, some seaweed apparently that will reduce the amount of uh, um, methane, which is another greenhouse gas, and that's what's in the in the uh, the the um, what what cattle are burping into the atmosphere. Um, at, at any rate, it reduces it considerably. But um, there's there's some issues there. Um, so so far, LED lights, um, solar panels. If you don't, if you don't, if you can't put solar panels on your house, we ought to be calling our power providers, whoever they are. Um, in in our case, it's a little electric co-op. Central Wisconsin Electric Co-op, and we tell them we want we want renewable energy, and if they offer renewable energy, buy it. It's 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 worth worth a little a little of extra cost. Um, so solar pen, eating a plant-rich diet, gardening, or buying local. Um, when you buy food that's been produced in California. Or when you when you buy food that's been produced in Mexico or wherever, all of the energy that's used to get that food to your grocery store is uh, is that's the greenhouse gas is connected with that. That's going up into the atmosphere, and that's you know warming our planet, changing our climate. So um, buy local, and if you can, garden. We've been gardening. I've been gardening since 1974, and um, boy, I, it's it's wonderful. Good exercise keeps us busy and provides good, healthy food in our in our freezer, in our canning jars, and in our diet. And um, you know, I don't use pesticides, and I've never really had a need to use pesticides except for potatoes. And we pick the potato bugs off of our potatoes, uh, but uh, that only lasts for a short while, and then the potato beetles are gone. Also, wind energy. Be a supporter of wind energy. When I went to the Midwest Renewable Energy Association people and said, I want to put, I didn't go there saying I wanted to put solar panels on my roof. I said I wanted to put wind uh, panel, uh, wind turbine up and they talked me out of it. Uh, they said, you have to put it at least 100 feet in the air. You have to do maintenance on it twice a year. You know, I'm 72 years old next week. I don't want to climb 200, 100 feet in the air and do maintenance on a wind turbine. They said, put the solar panels on your house. Wisconsin has a pretty decent solar resource. And I would have to say that we do. Um, this, this month, we will produce on a fairly small system, we will produce um, over 400 kilowatt hours if we keep getting a little bit of sunshine here for the rest of the month. Well, we're already up around 325 kilowatt hours for the month. So um, um, let's see, what else can I tell you about here? Um, here's a good one, plant some trees. Uh, trees are a carbon sink. Um, and so if we, if we keep our forests healthy, if we plant trees, we can actually suck carbon right out of the atmosphere, which is good for us all. Um, other issues that are connected, I don't know, most of you, I imagine, live in Wausau. Um, I'm guessing, I can't, I, I don't know that for sure. But uh, boy, mass transit is important. And wouldn't it be wonderful if Wausau had electric buses? Electric buses are popping up all over the world, in particular in China. Um, almost all of the electric buses in the world are in China for, right now, but they're starting to make their, their way into the United States and in our own state. Um, let me see. I think. Uh, uh, Racine just bought some. Madison is in, is in the process of buying some. I believe Milwaukee is in the process of buying some, and not in our in our state, but close by. Duluth has some, and they work. They work pretty well. I think there are some issues that you know uh, with the, the new technology, folks have to get around. But uh, they're out there, and wouldn't it be neat to put 
to, to jump on a nice, quiet, clean electric bus instead of the, the, the diesel ones that, that, that we use today. So I think those are, those are primarily um, my suggestions, things that we can do. Um, I'm going to repeat the idea of getting involved with the Citizens Climate Lobby. You can go to citizensclimatelobby.org, Google that. You can then find our chapter, which is the Rib Mountain Marshfield chapter. Or, um, and if you have a pencil handy and some paper handy, you can contact me at DM, as in Mary, Bart, B A R T H, 57 at gmail.com. Um, I'd love to hear from you, and we have some really neat people. We're doing some really neat things, uh, one of which is Earth Day, which will happen once we're allowed to do it. We'll plant a tree, we'll have a march, we'll have some speakers, usually a good speaker, and uh, so that's uh, some one of the things that we do. Okay, pardon me? Oh, yeah, my wife just reminded me, and uh, we'll, I'll put, while Brian is, is doing his part of the presentation, I'll find a screen. Uh, there's a, a really good evangelical Christian climate scientist of considerable renown by the name of Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. She's going to be doing, a, a, a give us give a, an Earth Day speech this Saturday that you can register for, it's free. And I think it would be a really neat experience to hear from her. Um, She's a, a, a remarkable person at being able to bridge that divide between that political divide about climate change. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I will get that up for us in a little while. In the meantime, I'm gonna turn this over to a good friend of mine who's been involved with the Citizens Climate Lobby uh, for about as long as I have. His name is, is Brian Bushnell, um, living in the Wausau area. And um, Brian is going to talk about well why we need to be involved politically. Um, it's uh, it's as I said earlier, it's one thing for us to do these things, but we all need to do them. And so um, I think I'm going to share this now with Brian, and Brian will 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 carry on. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dan. Um, hopefully. The screen will shift here in a moment and other people can see me. Um, not sure. Do I need to do something uh, to get myself on the screen uh, other than in a little box on the right? Um, if you change your speaker view or you may have pinned Dan's video. But I can see you and I have you in a grid view or gallery view. Um, what, what, did, what did I need to do? To In the upper right hand corner, um, if you go to your speaker view and click on that, you might be able to switch it to gallery view. Okay. Do you see and everyone now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, can, can people see me? Yep. Maybe turn okay. on a light. Hmm. A little dark, huh? Um, I can try a light. Hang on. Does that help any? Apparently not a lot. Um, that helped well, a little bit. Other people Okay, if, if other people can see me, um, I'm going to try to do a share as well because I have some slides queued up from Citizens Climate Lobby that, that will uh, go along with, with my uh, remarks. So let me try that. Uh, Let's see here. Are you able to see what I'm sharing or no? No, I can't. Make sure you click done and your share. Make sure you click done and 
I did. I did click on share. Um, Zoom wants to share the contents of the screen, so um, I'm trying to get it to do that. Um, okay, so there we go. It's, it's working. Okay. There we go. I'm finally seeing it. Okay. Okay. So, um, so Citizens Climate Lobby has been working um, laser focused on a bipartisan approach, politically, but bipartisan, um, called Carbon Fee and Dividend. And about a year ago, I believe, a bill was introduced to the House of Representatives, uh, numbered House HR 763, titled the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. So um, the prime person that started it is uh, Ted Deutsch, a Republican House member from Florida, the Miami area, I think. Um, and there are now some 80 or 82 or more co-sponsors, unfortunately, most of whom are Democrats. Um, we know that there are Republican House members that are sympathetic, but they have not signed on as co-sponsors. And the other disappointing thing uh, with this, it has been referred to the House Ways and Means Committee, a very, very prestigious committee in the House of Representatives, but it has not come out of that committee. Um, and of course, if you follow politics at all, you know that a lot of stuff has been going on and now with the virus, um, nothing seems to get done anywhere in the world except virus. So, um, the, the, the way the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act works is to charge a fee on fossil fuels at the source, at the mine, at the wellhead, um, where, wherever that carbon fuel comes, energy comes out of the ground primarily. The, the charge is $15 per ton to start, per ton of CO2 admitted, emitted when it is burned. That fee rises over time um, to make carbon energy much less cost effective and uh, alternative cleaner fuels much more um, acceptable, price acceptable, um, much more, um, but I, the word I'm looking for is people are going to want it. Uh, businesses are going to want it. Factories are going to want it because it's cheaper. Um, goods and services produced from that energy will be, should be, or could be cheaper than those produced from carbon energy. It's a lot like the tax that went on tobacco and has had a major impact on the use of tobacco in our society um, over time. Then, and that we believe, and CCL believes, that it will encourage innovation. Um, it needs to encourage widespread adoption of uh, alternative energy as a source, alternative energy as the production. Uh, and then it needs to re, uh, encourage research and development. Um, heavily with efficiency of both solar panels and wind turbines. Although at this point, both wind and solar is the cheapest installed solar source of electrical energy 
in the United States at something on the order of three cents per kilowatt hour. So all of the money collected from that fee is returned to the households, to every citizen of the United States, except for a small amount of administrative fee costs that would make. The whole purpose of that is to assure that people have a way of offsetting the higher prices of goods and services um, as carbon energy becomes more expensive. CCL has um, contracted for extensive modeling that indicates that the lowest 60% of income households in the United States would benefit more from the dividend than the cost, the increased cost that they're experiencing. The, the dividend does several things in addition to that. Number one, politically, it means that the money doesn't stay it in Washington. It doesn't grow the size of government. It comes back. It is not a tax because it does not stay in Washington. Hopefully that appeals to conservatives that want small government, or at least talk about that. The other thing, when France about a year ago imposed a uh, tax on uh, gasoline, I think of primarily, but res that resulted in the yellow vest riots across France because there was no mechanism to offset that increased cost back to the citizens. So by doing the dividend, that should uh, respond to that issue. The carbon fee and dividend approach says that every citizen can choose how they want to purchase, what they want to purchase, whether they purchase carbon or uh, energy or alternative energy and goods and services provided that way. So if the person that I see driving a Hummer down Grand Avenue in Wausau with a license plate proudly proclaiming four miles per gallon, if he wants to continue to use that vehicle and drive it that way, that's his choice and um, uh, nobody interferes with that. Uh, the, the approach says we're going to be market-based, we're not going to pick winners, uh, we're going to encourage people to, uh, to make different choices, choices that we believe in CCL um, are better choices. So again, the, the fee goes up every year by $10 per ton adjusted for inflation until greenhouse gas emissions are reduced by 90%. There's limited regulatory adjustment um, that if, there, if the goals uh, of uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction are not met, uh, regulations can come back. Uh, in the meantime, most, my, many of the regulations that have been around are, or could be around are uh, put on hold. So it's the act is good for the environment, it's good for, uh, it reduces greenhouse gases. It will, um, if I can find here, it's good for people, good for the economy, revenue neutral. Um, it reduces emissions faster than uh, business as usual. It reduces um, business uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, much more than any of the other uh, proposals out there and quicker. Um, 
and that's that's an important issue since um, many of the climate scientists are saying that this is we have limited time we're approaching if we have not all already passed some significant tipping points in the climate okay so it's effective and it reduces uh, greenhouse gas emissions families get the dividend back and uh, in 10 years uh, a family of four could get uh, $4,400 per year um, those are equal shares to each adult citizen of the United States and half shares for up to two children so yet uh, a family of four would get three shares of the dividend. Addressing uh, an issue that Dr. Koyowitz came uh, mentioned, we get a healthier environment that 114,000 lives lost each year due to air pollution now, uh, 295,000 lives through 2030 because of better air quality. The modeling indicates that, that more jobs are created than business as usual today. Um, so $240 billion in annual costs from environmental and health harms of fuel, 2.1 million jobs created over the, over the 10 years. Um, we know, or at least we believe it's bipartisan. Um, it's very difficult to get any Republican these days to openly admit that they are interested, although there are more than uh, people, uh, more representatives and senators that are um, coming on board and going public. Um, there's even a bill in the Senate, as I recall, and I don't, I, I don't recall the details, uh, but actually there's a Senate bill that has gone nowhere at this point, but uh, that is sponsored by Republicans, conservatives. There is also a group that is closely allied with Citizens Climate Lobby called Republic EN. So uh, if you do a search for Republic EN, you will find that group. These are very conservative people from across the country that are organizing similar to CCL to uh, uh, support and encourage uh, addressing climate change. <clears throat> it's revenue neutral. The government will not keep any of the fees collected. A, a side note, Washington State in 2016 and 2018 had a ballot initiative. Um, both of those years, proposing uh, a, clim a, a, a carbon fee and dividend uh, approach similar uh, but tailor made to their state and their constitution. It was defeated both times because environmental groups like the Sierra Club and others joined with business, the Chamber of Commerce and other uh, carbon energy groups to oppose it. Um, those, um, those environmental groups opposed it because they, they liked the fee they like the in the revenue, but they want to keep it in Washington and use it for other things. Many of which I would agree with. Uh, more research and development, more development and, and expansion of alternative fuels. But the problem is that the politics don't work with that approach. Because um, conservatives are just not going to buy in to that approach. Um, okay. So it's effective, it reduces emissions, it's good for people, it improves health, saves lives, um, good for the economy. So 
Um, I'm going to look, um, I'm going to refer to um, the, the National Citizen Climate Lobby is Citizens Climate Lobby, all one word, or all together, all lowercase, dot org. Um, we encourage you to go and visit um, that website, look around. There is a page uh, or, or a section uh, where you can look to see where other uh, chapters exist. There are five chapters around the seventh district in addition to us. Um, and we also have a Facebook page titled Citizens Climate, Climate Lobby Red Mountain Marshfield. So if you do Facebook kind of things, uh, do a search for that. We try to keep that um, up to date and, and changing. Um, so I think um, that I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, turn it back to Dan, and um, I'm. I would look forward to Q and A. I just have one more thing to say before we, we get into the uh, question, the, the Q&A uh, kind of thing, and that is this. Um, it, it took us a while uh, to really take uh, the coronavirus seriously. Um, and, and, and since then, I think we really are taking it pretty seriously. And we're having uh, a hopeful impact on the future course of the disease. Uh, climate change is not going to be something that we can deal with when things get really, really bad. Um, the, the, the carbon that's in our atmosphere will be there for hundreds of years. Uh, we're, we keep adding to that load of carbon in the atmosphere every day. Um, and that, that, that's not going to be a shift that we can turn around in a matter of a couple months. Uh, we need to get going on this now. Uh, there are, there are um, tipping points out there that Brian had referred to earlier um, that are emerging already. One of them is the melting of the, of the sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. Um, as the sea ice melts, um, it, it reflects less uh, sunlight back, the water warms, and it causes more melting of ice. So that, that's a tipping point we've already reached. Another tipping point, and the one that has most people really concerned, is what's happening to the stored up methane and carbon dioxide in the permafrost in the, the, the you know, up in the frozen north. As that stuff starts to melt, um, that's going to release a lot of methane and a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and it will reach uh, a point at which we aren't going to be able to turn that one around. Uh, right now, we can we can do what we need to do to avoid this, the most serious consequences of climate change. Um, but boy, the longer we put it off, the harder it's going to get, and the more suffering there will be as a result. And so. Um, with that, um, I guess I'm opening it up to your questions, and we look forward to having a conversation with you. So if you guys are interested in asking questions with like your voices rather than typing them into chat, just make sure to raise your hand first so that we know you're going to be jumping in to ask your question. Otherwise, toss it into the chat box. And... Um, I will make sure to let him know what questions pop up there too. All right, we got Kathy. You're muted, Kathy. So thank you very much for this discussion. This was wonderful. I'm so impressed that we were able to do this and put this all together. Um, I am wondering, uh, recently, I read a book called Kiss the Ground, and the idea in the book, the author 
said that the way to correct climate change, to control climate change, is to um, go entirely to sustainable agriculture. That the big problem for us is the way we grow our food. So we need our fields always covered with a cover crop, for instance, when they're not being used. And we need to go to grass-fed beef and things like that. So I'm wondering how that fits into your picture, if you have um, thought about that as a, a component to um, climate change, or what your reaction is to the idea that our big problem is the way we grow our food. Well, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to address it uh, two ways. One is I'm going to refer you to that book drawdown that I mentioned earlier. You don't have to buy the book. You can get all the information off the internet free, uh, just by going. I think I googled drawdown and I came up with the website in a real in a real hurry. And and uh, the authors of drawdown are uh, some well-known scientists from around the world. It was. It was edited by a guy named Paul Hawken, who some of you will know. Um, at any rate, they said, Here's, here are the best things that we can do. And you are right, Kathleen, that, that um, uh, agriculture plays a very large role in this. But I'm also going to remind you that in reality, at the present time, uh, transportation is the number one source of greenhouse gases. So. Um, the things, I, I listed some things when I talked earlier about things that we, you and I can do. But if you get into that book, Drawdown, what you'll find is that there are all kinds of, of uh, places that, that, that this global effort will require, and certainly agriculture is one of them. And, um, and, and I, I, I think you bring up a very good point, and I want to thank you for bringing it up. Uh, and and is huge. And can I break in? Sure. Um, I would add, add that there is no single cause uh, of climate change. It, there's all kinds of, and agriculture certainly is, uh, is a contributor, a major contributor, <coughs> as is transportation and other things. There is no single cause. There is no silver bullet that is going to solve climate change. There is silver buckshot. All kinds of stuff needs to happen. The, the fee and dividend approach, the carbon fee is going to make traditional agriculture more expensive to do, to do is going to increase the cost of uh, food produced from traditional methods. There's all kinds of research about how to change how we grow things um, that will benefit the earth in all kinds of ways, including less runoff into streams and lakes uh, that contributes to the algae blooms and all of that. So, Again, I am not dismissing your point. I'm just saying it's one of several. And carbon fee and dividend will stimulate the need to change all kinds of things, agriculture, transportation, um, and other things. So enough said. Um, so the other thing, oh, sorry. Uh, we just have one question for um, Dan real quick, that you could please share the evangelical speaker's information in the chat. All right. I'm, I actually, I'm going to just for a minute, I don't, I don't know how to do it in the chat. How do I do that? Um, you should be able to open Go ahead. You should be able to, do you see the chat function down on your lower bar? I do. So if you click on that, um, it should okay, pop up I'm a box. I'm looking at it right now. And then you should be able to type in the lower part of the box and send it to everyone. Okay. I'm gonna also, I'm going to put it up on the screen, I think. Um, there is a 
I'm, I'm going to actually, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to get the, and I'll put the link, you need to register for it, and you need to, you need to get to the, to the, uh, the, the, the website to do that. So, um, um, briefly, I'm going to put up on this, and then I copy the link. In the meantime, if I can, um, you, if you go to the and search around, you find the um, announcement. You, if you click on that, you should get the information about Catherine Hayhoe as well as how to sign up for it. It's going to be this Saturday, the 25th. It's going to run, I believe, from 11 a.m. Central Time um, to late in the afternoon because Catherine Hale is the um, keynote speaker, but there are also going to be some breakout workshops later in the afternoon. So I encourage you, since all of you are connected to this presentation via the internet, all of you have the ability to do an internet search uh, and find citizensclimatelobby.org um, and get connected. So if you get to, the, get to our homepage and just scroll down a little ways, you'll find the, the way to hook into the Earth Day celebration. Which I'm okay. Okay. Other questions? Um, we did have one question in the chat um, asking that you could tell us a little bit more about the Rib Mountain Group and what they are doing. Well, okay. Um, uh, the Rib Mountain uh, Marshfield Group uh, do a variety of things. Uh, one of them is that uh, we, we pursue our legislators every month with phone calls, and that would be uh, Senator Tamley Baldwin, Senator Ron jo Johnson, and um, whoever our new representative will become, we assume, in May. Um, and we, we send them letters uh, together with other chapters in the 7th District. We have a, a Citizens Climate Lobby has a chapter here in the Wausau Marshfield area, and that includes some folks from Lincoln County up in Merrill. Uh, but we also have chapters uh, around the, the 7th District. We have one up in Bayfield, Ashland. Uh, we have one over in Hayward. We have one in uh, Birchwood. We have another over in Hudson. And together, we, are, we, we, we send letters every month to our legislators uh, asking them to get on board. Uh, we meet with our... We, uh, we have liaisons to the different uh, representatives that we have. Uh, we, um, we meet with, with them regularly to pursue um, our, our concerns about legislation to do something about climate change, you know, the things that Brian was talking about. Uh, we also do presentations like this. Uh, last year um, in, in February, we had a gentleman who was a retired uh, DNR fisheries biologist, named Frank Pratt, and he told about how climate change is what what climate change is doing to the fishing in the state of Wisconsin, and um, and, and it was very well received. He was a very interesting gentleman, uh, surprised a lot of people. We had contacts from people then who said, well, one of the things that he said was that 
walleyes and, and big northerns and a variety of other cold water fish like trout are, are going away in Wisconsin. Uh, will probably be gone by the end of the century. And uh, people wanted to know what they could do to save their lake because they were already seeing their lake um, going from walleye lakes to uh, bass and panfish lakes, which is what uh, Frank Pratt said was the inevitable progression for with lakes in northern Wisconsin. So um, we do things like that. We, we have sponsored uh, three Earth Days in a row. Uh, this was, we were supposed to have our fourth one this coming Saturday. However, we won't be getting together because of the coronavirus. Um, most of us will be watching uh, Catherine Hayhoe instead. But uh, once we can get back together again, what we do is we have a march, we have a teacher, we plant an Earth Day tree over in Oak Island Park in Wausau. And, um, and so that will be coming up. Uh, those are the kinds of things that the climate, uh, our chapter is doing. So we're a, we're a very busy chapter. We help two chapters get started. Um, the one in Birchwood and actually the one up in the Hayward area. I mean, not Hayward, but up in, in uh, um, Ashland Bayfield. So uh, Rhinelander, ben. very active. <laughs> actually, it was Rhinelander area, uh, Dan. Oh yeah, I guess it was. That's right. It was the Rhinelander area. Sorry, forgot that one. One other thing, as long as I've broken in, Dan, one of the major things that we've been doing for the last year is uh, approaching uh, governmental units uh, about uh, trying to get a resolution and support for House of Representatives Bill 763. And we did get a resolution passed by the city of Wausau um, last August. We approached uh, the Marathon County Board uh, through one of the committees. We were able to do a presentation similar to this to that committee. We were not able to get them to consider a resolution uh, uh, of support. Um, and we approached uh, or we assisted some people in Merrill uh, to approach the Lincoln County Board of Supervisors. Um, and that was in the process, um, but then uh, meetings uh, of their group have uh, uh, shut down essentially. So um, I'm not sure what that is, where that is at this point. Good question though, thank you. And thank you, Brian. Other questions? We have a few minutes left. Say, Dan. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ruth. I was going to ask in terms of <clears throat> garden and yard, um, did you say no fertilize, um, no harmful fertilizers, or no, um, you don't use any pesticides? Yeah, we don't, I, I'm a big believer in, in, um, in, in organic uh, food. Um, I, I just know that uh, when, you put, when you put a pesticide on a plant, it gets absorbed into that plant. When you, it's, you can't just necessarily wash it off. off. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. I've been gardening organically for, well, since 1974, and I don't seem to have any problems with it. Um, I do try to use um, manure, and that's one of the one of the best ways of fertilizing our garden. But uh, uh, planting cover crop crops and things like that also are are very helpful. As is composting. Uh, my wife is a big believer in compost. Everything goes out on the compost box. Um, but we eat sometimes we in the summertime, in particular when we're eating fresh foods, we go man, we eat like kings and queens here, um, and uh, and, and we don't use a lot of, uh, and there's not a lot of carbon going into the atmosphere as a result of, of, uh, of our gardening. So, do you garden too, Ruth? Yes, yes, uh, on a small scale. It's gotten smaller over the years. In terms of care of your yard, um, is there anything organic that you can actually use in the yard itself to keep uh, weeds down? Well, I don't, I don't really have too much of a problem with weeds in our yard. and. 
but I will say that I do, uh, I did get an, uh, a rechargeable electric lawnmower. So um, rather than using, using uh, uh, putting carbon emissions in the atmosphere, cutting our lawn, I just plug it in. Uh, always, always recharge the battery during the daytime. See, with our power company, um, we use our electricity first that we that we produce from the solar panels, and then what we don't use, we sell to them at seven cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so, if I charge, if I'm charging my car or charging the battery in my electric lawnmower up during the daytime when the sun is shining. Well, even when the sun, it, it, I mean, it, it has to be very, very cloudy or snowing for us not to be producing some electricity. At any rate, I charge the battery up for our lawnmower um, off, the, off, off the solar panel. So there's a, all, oh, it's an amazing, what amazing. Um, another thing that I didn't mention is uh, trying to reduce as much as you possibly can the amount of plastics that you're putting into your shopping cart. Uh, that's made, those are made with fossil fuels. Most of them, I think only 10% of the, of the uh, plastic that we, try, that we think we're recycling actually, actually gets recycled. The rest of it enters our environment and is now entering the bodies of the, the plants, animals, fish, um, we're breathing it in because a lot of it's getting burned. Uh, that plastic doesn't go away. It stays in the environment. So uh, we're, we're working really hard to reduce, significantly reduce the amount of plastic that goes in our shopping cart. One of the worst ones are those clamshell uh, plastics. None of those are recyclable. And so um, anything that you buy from blueberries to lettuce in those plastic clamshells, uh, that that's not getting recycled. Um, something not good is happening with that plastic to our environment. Um, and yeah. um, can I break in uh, and go for in a different direction for a minute or two? Sure. Um, I'd like to make a pitch. Our our group has got a lot of people on the list, but relatively small number that are active in doing helping doing things. We need more people that are willing to get involved, roll up their sleeves, um, do more than write letters. Um, we also need people who are uh, capable and knowledgeable about social media kinds of things, other than Facebook, um, Instagram, Snapchat, um, all of those things that I'm too old to understand or, or be involved in but younger folks are really involved. And we would really like to get, uh, find some ways to approach and get younger folks involved. Um, we don't seem to have been successful with that. Uh, we're, we're really in need of people who are willing and able to uh, approach some of the other um, groups around. Um, and from out in the in the county, uh, where we would really like to be less involved with the Wausau metro area and get out to Marathon, Stratford, Edgar, wherever. Um, so if there are people out there that know those kinds of people, uh, please encourage them to get in touch with us and get involved with us. So uh, that's my pitch. I just put my um, email address and my phone number up on the chat screen, but I see it only went to Ruth. How can I, how can I send that to everybody? Oh, wait, wait a minute, hang on. I'm gonna try it again. Well, Dan is doing that. <clears throat> we want. We certainly want to um, 
thank uh, Dr. Bruce Kraswitz, Brian Bruchnell, Dan himself, in um, bringing us um, these ideas, this programming. Um, maybe because Dan is typing into that snap area or that chat area, he could add the name of the speaker that he was talking about that's going to come on Saturday or maybe that link if you have time to. Um, uh, the link should be on the, on, on the, um, uh, okay, let me hang on a second. I'm going to go. Well, the other thing too is we can, anything that Dan has to share, if you want, Dan, if you want to send me an email with all of it, we can email it out to everyone in the groups. I will do that. Um, if you go into the chat, um, I did put in the link to Catherine Hayhoe, and for some reason I can't seem to get out of sending the message just to, uh, just to Ruth. And I copied and reshared it again to everyone. Okay. All right. Okay. My question is, you've encouraged, uh, you know, the use of uh, wind power. My understanding, those turbines have to be serviced each year, and it is extremely expensive. Any comment on that? Yeah, the, the, all I can tell you, Mary, and I think it's a good question, um, is that wind power is growing so fast around the world, it's now providing the cheapest energy available. Um, and so while I wouldn't, I wouldn't put one up on my place, um, the, 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 the big um, the big corporate, the, the companies that are putting these up um, all over in our oceans, and I, we just came back from from uh, um, Grand Junction, Colorado, and drove through several large wind farms. They know what they're doing, and they're providing, this, despite the the, um, the maintenance costs, uh, apparently it's cheap enough that they can sell that electricity um, and, and compete with anything, any other source of electricity out there, including coal. So um, that's, that's the best answer I can give you. Uh, if I could break in again, um, it's interesting for, for me to note that the states in the United States that are producing the most renewable energy, mostly from wind, number one is Texas, followed by Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Iowa, all of them very conservative states, but are um, expanding particularly wind power. Because, uh, and uh, a good part of that is because they're prairie states. Um, and I saw a thing one time that there's nothing between the North Pole and Texas but one standard, strand of barbed wire. So there's nothing that interferes with wind uh, in the way that it, in, in other areas. Um, so wind power, but it's, it's mostly big installations. Um, yeah, yeah, along Interstate 90 west of, through Minnesota, out into the Dakotas, uh, there's all kinds of wind. I'm going to put a plug in here for um, solar uh, electricity. Um, the Midwest Renewable Energy Association in Stevens Point offers a solar by uh, um, a solar program in which the more people who sign up to have solar power installed on their roofs um, every year, that you get a um, a, a refund on on the purchase price. That's how we did it. Um, our, our, uh, our solar panels started off at about $12,000 and by the time we got a refund automatically from our power company for $1,500, then we got $600 from uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Midwest Renewable Energy Association and then um, you, get a, you get a tax break and I used a, an, an uh, IRA to pay for the panels. Um, I didn't pay any taxes on that money that I was due to pay for the panels because of the federal uh, 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 income tax refund for putting them on your roof. 
it ended up being around an $8,500 investment that is paying off every day that the sun shines. So um, it's a great investment, and it's good for it's it's good it's good for your your pocketbook as is the as is the electric car. Um, I bought a used car, and uh, the price was very reasonable for a used car. And every time I see people pulling into the gas station, I go, "What are they doing?" Um, this works so darn well. I don't mind keeping the money in my pocket. I, I don't know if you know it, but in this state, every year we send $14 billion, that's with a B, out of this state to pay for the energy that we import because we don't have any oil and gas here. We don't have coal in this state. Every bit of electricity, all the fuel that we put in our cars, we have to get that from somebody else. Uh, wouldn't it be better to keep it in your pocket? Um, that's my, you know, I, I, I just, um, I can't say enough good about having the electric car and the solar panel. I think they're wonderful. Um, Dan, we did have another question. What's the hope for fourth generation nuclear plants like Bill Gates is supporting? Boy, um, you know, I'm not a huge supporter of nuclear energy, but I will tell you that um, um, according to the the models that the, that the Citizens Climate Lobby um, has um, um, has gotten in, in the modeling companies that the Citizens Climate Lobby has gotten involved with, they all predict that, that nuclear energy will expand. I certainly hope that um, nuclear energy will overcome, I think, the greatest, the greatest threat, and that is, you know, what happens in the case of a nuclear accident and what happens with the waste. Um, if we can, if we can do nuclear energy um, um, in a, in a way that that isn't, you know, as dangerous to the health and well-being of the people on this planet as electric and and as solar electricity and wind energy is, I'm all for it, I guess. Um, but that's my comment. I know that there are plenty of people who um, are, are are knowledgeable in this in this area who say that. But right now, uh, we're going to need um, nuclear energy, and I can see a, uh, I can see the logic behind it. But I, I still kind of personally, I sort of choke on all of the environmental issues issues connected with with nuclear energy. Uh, yeah, that company uh, of Bill Gates is called Terra Power, and you can look it up on the internet. It's just terrapower.com. And uh, the idea is that uh, uh, it's much safer uh, nuclear energy. And the reason it's much safer is that it's not cooled with water that's under high pressure. Like uh, the nuclear accidents that have occurred in the past uh, happened when the cooling system failed. Uh, and um, so in this case, what would happen with these new uh, plans is that the plants uh, would shut down in the event of a cooling problem. So instead of overheating, it would, it would shut down. Uh, and the other thing is that these new, this new idea uses uh, waste from other nuclear power plants to generate energy. So it actually uh, runs on nuclear waste, not exactly the same nuclear power that the old model, like, uh, like uh, Chernobyl type nuclear reactors run on. So um, uh, this, uh, this idea uh, is uh, possibly a much safer and much more efficient idea than the current generation of nuclear reactors. However, as far as I know, none has been built in the United States. And I think the only people right now interested in this idea are uh, Chinese, are Chinese uh, people, and they might be building some of these smaller and hopefully safer nuclear reactors in China.
Okay, so just in the interest of time, um, we are just approaching the 1130 mark. So um, if anyone has one final question, they can toss it into the chat box or unmute themselves real quick. Oh, Bruce has one more question. This will be the last question then. Oh, okay, this really isn't a question. I'd just like to put in one quick um, plug for the carbon fee and dividend idea. I think that all these other good ideas are, are all augmented by the carbon fee and dividend approach. That is, it will only help uh, and it won't hinder. It, it, it worked, they would work together. That's all. Okay, awesome. So um, thank you guys so much for being here today. I know we had a handful of people who jumped out. There was some sound issues for a minute there. Um, but if you guys, I know Dan did share his contact information. And Dan, are you okay with us sharing that um, to everybody who attended and Absolutely. allowing them to connect? Absolutely. Feel free to do that. I encourage it. Okay, Thank wonderful. So we will make sure to share all of this information with everyone. We have been recording this. I would speak.